Morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I got back home from Iowa uh, uh, earlier this morning, and uh, I'm using that as an excuse not to try and work out how to get back to go. <laughs> My talk this morning, though, is about um, aspects of the, the Flodden 500 project, a major look, a uh, re-examination of the, the battle that uh, took place all those years ago. And my contribution to it uh, was looking at who amongst the Scots were involved in it and how they actually got to the battle, how they actually participated. And I have to say, my, my starting point was the assumption that a whole load of guys got together in Edinburgh, marched down the road to uh, Elam and then over the border and fought the battle, and that was about it. But inevitably, when you, you examine something like this in more detail, it turns out to be very much more complicated and very much more interesting. And um, I uh, apologise if, if what I'm about to present uh, sounds very largely documentary uh, research. Um, it is part of a wider project. This afternoon, uh, Richard Carlton will be looking at some of the field work that has flowed from uh, this examination. It's also, I think, a slightly different approach to conflict archaeology, which has often tended to focus on uh, events and miserable places for a few hours or so on particular days when men did unspeakable things to each other and uh, attempts a, a wider picture. So just to remind you, this is a, a major battle between uh, the Scots and the English on the 9th of September 1513 at Flodden, just over the border in England with the Scottish army led by King James IV and the English army led by the Earl of Surrey. And while we Scots um, remember battles like Bannockburn with almost a punch in the air, thinking, oh, yes, Bannockburn, wasn't that a fantastic victory? Uh, Flodden is the exact, an exact antithesis. There's a shiver goes down our spine to remember what a disaster it was. Not that we cover it up, it's something that's very much part of our psyche and something that we're quite happy to go on about. It's worth just reminding you, however, that the actual land campaign in 1513 was uh, part of a much wider world picture. In going to fight in England, um, we were very much supporting um, our uh, allies, the French, under uh, Louis the Twelfth, and we're not just talking about a land campaign, um, and we're not just talking about an alliance with the English. We had significant allies in, in the form of the O'Donnells of uh, Tyrconnell in Ireland, who were trying to involve in the fighting, and also with uh, the Danes under King Hans. And a large part of the project in 1513 involved uh, a Scottish fleet of 11 ships sailing around Scotland to attack um, Carrickfergus. And there was another Scottish fleet of smaller ships under Robert Barton sailing from the north of France to connect up with those. We don't know whether the connection was made. We don't know the full extent of the, the damage that was done in Ireland at that time. But the Scottish fleet then sailed to the, uh, the channel to try and um, stop the, um, or impede the progress of Henry VIII's invasion of France or, or stop his return. So it was worth remembering that, that the actual battle was, was only uh, a small part of what was happening. Um, and of course the Scots at that time had quite a, a formidable uh, reputation as uh, people who could fight and win naval campaigns. The other thing that I think um, um, one has to remember is that um, the fighting at this time was very much, um, um, there were a lot of new developments in warfare, new techniques, and it's very difficult um, from reading uh, modern historians uh, to, to gauge how one should view uh, James IV and uh, what he was actually up to at that time. But certainly one way of reading the, the, the quite extensive documents that survive is that um, Scotland under James IV was quite military adept. James had a, a considerable amount of experience 
uh, in mounting campaigns, both on land and on sea. He had uh, quite a considerable military infrastructure uh, compared with uh, the development things of things in the medieval period in Scotland. Access to uh, quite a considerable amount of skilled craftsmen who cast guns and built ships and so on. And one of the other things that I think comes across very strongly from the surviving contemporary documentation, which I, I, and also what I'm talking about here is surviving payments, royal payments to craftsmen and to various people who were involved, is a very impressive Scottish civil service um, who organised things, which no doubt is what we still have today, by the way. <laughs> Um, and one of the, uh, the main things to remember about Flodden, of course, is that the Scots were um, using um, a different approach to fighting. Um, it appears pretty clear that they were brigaded in, in large foot units uh, with uh, a new type of weapon, a relatively new type of weapon, uh, pikes, which is very long spears, and we're talking about spears which are about 20 feet long. Um, and right away, um, th there is a, 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 an interesting interpretation to be made there. I think the traditional viewpoint is of, of Scots uh, units marching down to the, uh, the borders with these long pikes over the shoulders. And I think there's sufficient clues from the contemporary documentation that these pikes were issued from royal stores in Edinburgh Castle and probably travelled down separately in wagons. So it's, it's just. When you start looking at this documentation, it's, it's forming a different impression and different scope for studying the, the archaeology um, of events. One of the things that's best documented is the, um, is the siege train the Scots took down, and that's what a large part of the campaign was about, was taking out uh, English castles in the east border. And we're talking about taking 17 very large guns from Edinburgh Castle over the Lama Muirs, and there's some of the statistics that we've got from contemporary documents about the number of oxen and drivers and other workmen that were involved. And you think of what those roads over the Lama Muirs are like now, uh, you can perhaps get some sense of the, of the challenge to take out a force like that. So one of the, 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 the obvious objectives in, in doing this research was to get at an impression of just um, who was involved and how many people. And there's certainly a fair amount of documentation um, about the losses. And I made a list there, the, the king, nine out of 20 earls, 12 out of 30 lords, the archbishop of St Andrews, and uh, two abbots. Quite devastating uh, losses. Um, when one looks at uh, this, this potential size of the armies, um, there's a plethora of figures uh, to deal with from near contemporary sources, reports by ambassadors and other people, which tend to give uh, figures like uh, 100,000 or 80,000 for the size of the Scottish army. Now, there isn't time in a presentation like this to go into all the ins and outs of this, but it seems pretty clear to me uh, when you look at figures like these, that they're, they're incredibly uh, exaggerated. Um, if you do a wider study of the size of armies which operated in this country, this island, uh, prior to mechanisation, prior to railways, it seems to me that there are factors that come into play. Um, there were certain sizes beyond which you couldn't actually operate uh, a body of men, and medieval generals probably understood this. If you think of it in terms of, you imagine you're a, a general, you've got, you know, sort of 20,000 men for the sake of argument, and you're saying to them, right, line up there, march across those hills, um, half a mile down the road, all turn right and remain in order. And even if you just sort of think through, how do you give those instructions, how do you get them to do that? and all the other infrastructure that you need to feed them and provide them, you start seeing that perhaps there were factors, um, complicating factors that made it very difficult just to have extremely large bodies of men. And to cut a long story short, I think that extrapolating from other campaigns and other information, it'd be most unlikely if the Scottish army was uh, much bigger than 20,000 on the day of the battle, probably about the same size as the English army, whom the same factors operated. I was probably dealing with uh, losses on the Scottish side of about uh, 5,000 
that would be a, represent quite a catastrophic loss for a pre-modern uh, battle, um, with the English perhaps losing uh, 1,500. That's partially based on their own uh, records. But a force like um, 20,000 wasn't uh, anything like all the people um, who were involved. Once you start factoring in all the other um, considerations that I think one has to, even down to the possibility that there were spectators, and we know that there were people mad enough to do that in battles in the past, and you look at the evidence for all the non-combatants, the, 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 the people who looked after the horses and the wagons <coughs> and who took supplies of food, and all the people who serviced the guns, um, you count up um, all the oxen and the horses that were ridden, um, factor in things like, you know, animals on the hoof um, that uh, acted as food. Um, you're perhaps dealing with, um, I can't do the arithmetic, I've forgotten what it is there, but as a, maybe if somebody can work out there, it's an awful lot of people uh, going down the road uh, towards the muster point at Ellen. <coughs> And the other thing I think that comes out from this research is that one's not actually thinking of one army moving in all one piece. One's probably looking at different contingents at different times, all converging on the final muster point at Ellen down in Berwickshire. There's a very interesting um, concept that comes through from um, late medieval documentation on the, uh, the uh, mustering of Scottish armies, and it's a concept uh, about the four quarters of the, of the country. Um, it's difficult to actually establish where the four quarters were at any one time, but that map there is my best guess uh, of what the four quarters were. And this was just uh, an administrative um, convenience so that you could actually say that you wanted the men from one quarter at a particular time and men from another quarter at another time. And sometimes for long campaigns, uh, it was just some of the, the men that were called out. In the case of Flodden, it was one of the occasions when it was a very full muster. There really were people going from Orkney and Shetland, the Western Isles, uh, and all over the place. And some of these people going on the Flodden campaign, like the ones who were coming from Orkney, for instance, um, they probably had journeys of about two weeks, even just to get down to uh, the muster point uh, at Ellen. Um, and there various routes to go. And one of the challenges, and something which I think uh, we need to uh, do more archaeology on, is, is, well, how did they do it? Um, at least I think we can establish where their, their likely um, starting point were, uh, the various um, places where local officials like sheriffs held weapon shaws, where people had to muster, show off their weapons, be selected, and then set off in the journey uh, for the final campaign. But there is, a, I mean, apart from the archaeology of looking at surviving roads, uh, there is, again, some quite useful documentation to look at uh, for this period on where the roads actually were. And a lot of contingents would probably have taken this route, which we can document from, for instance, the pilgrimages made by James IV on an annual basis at up to 10 uh, to seek forgiveness for um, contributing to the death of his father. And the evidence comes in the form of uh, payments of money to boatmen, to um, ferrymen, and so on, and payments for staying overnight. And you can start building up a, a picture of, of how uh, people could travel and how long it took um, though in the cases of the pilgrimage to Tain, probably the contingents going south didn't have to make a detour to, to visit the king's uh, mistress, as James did in his way up. And not just from the campaign in, in 1513, but uh, better quality documentation for other campaigns of the period, we can start building up a picture of locations where armies mustered or where they stopped um, overnight. Um, John's Cluch there, which is um, on the routeway from, if you like, Haddington over the Lammermuse down to Ellum, uh, was a place where uh, the artillery on a major campaign parked overnight in, in 1496. And it's probably the sort of place that we used on, on other occasions 
I suspect over the years with quite a tradition of finding appropriate camping grounds and so on. But one of the main keys to um, working out uh, where and when people manage to get together uh, for these campaigns is to understand the, uh, where there were crossing points on the major rivers. Now there's been a certain amount of um, work done on uh, medieval bridges and ferry points. One of the problems with bridges incidentally is that just because it was a bridge, for instance, in the early 15th century somewhere, doesn't mean to say it was actually operational in 1513. But nevertheless, there are lots of clues. Um, for instance, in um, a major campaign earlier in, in, in James's reign, 1496, we know the artillery went from Edinburgh uh, via uh, Musselburgh. And I think the, uh, the only reasonable explanation for that is that there must have been a bridge uh, at uh, Musselburgh at that time that they could take uh, large guns across. Um, and one of the key things archaeologically, I think, for us in, in terms of understanding campaigns uh, in the medieval period is um, a bridge outside Melrose, just a bit to the uh, west of Melrose over the Tweed, which we know, uh, and that's um, a, a drawing of it, um, it's, it's surviving in the late 18th century. We know that bridge was there in uh, 1523 and was capable of taking heavy guns. And the crucial thing is, was it there in 1513? Because if it was, that would give us a much greater understanding of, of what happened in that year. And if we could find some way archaeologically of looking at that, that would be a great boon, it seems to me. Anyway, using lots of uh, speculation and guesswork, um, what um, I've um, attempted to do is build up a picture of um, how an army in 1513 might have been gathered um, from the various uh, muster points around the country. Um, of course, for some people it involved boat journeys. Um, for instance, the, it looks like the contingents from Argyll would probably take the ships up um, um, the Clyde to Glasgow, if we can rely on information from later uh, mustering. Um, and I think that uh, what one could see, certainly, um, from uh, very detailed mustering information from 1523, is a process where there were regional um, centres like Glasgow, Stirling, Edinburgh, Modder, where contingents were mustered before going to the final muster point. And it's not just, um, and what one can also see from some of these documents is very clever um, planning so that there were no bottlenecks connected, so that contingents um, from the west, for instance, might cross a bridge at Glasgow the day before the contingents coming from um, Stirling. Um, not just so they weren't bottlenecks, but potentially so they weren't major punch ups uh, or wafts. There was certainly a sense that in some occasions that they're deliberately potentially routing different contingents down different roads at different times to avoid trouble. Uh, that's, that's my interpretation of, of how sophisticated uh, it could be. Um, and um, there is a lot of archaeology that could be done, it seems to me, at looking at some of these traditional uh, muster points and trying to understand what happened. And it's not just a, a degree of, of mustering, it's, 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 it's a process of filtering down. You're starting off potentially with um, hundreds of thousands of fensible men, if you like, and you're wanting to end up with an army which is um, about 20,000, maybe 25,000 strong. Um, you're maybe trying to stop most of these guys moving from the localities, but there has to be some process. The final one being at Elam, just uh, our side of the border, where presumably the army's been must have reviewed and people are, are understanding what their place in the ranks actually is. So um, this is my best speculative guess of um, how things might have worked in um, 1513, September 1513. And I might say that one of the, the very few uh, hard bits of evidence we've got to go on, incidentally, and this shows that how you got to sort of try and build on 
on, on, on material is that there's a payment um, by the Lord Treasurer um, for an oxen that was for an ox that was run over by the wheels of a gun in Dalkeith uh, about the right date for the gun going south. And that has to be the evidence that the artillery train was taking that route uh, by Dalkeith and Sutra uh, and Lauder uh, to get down to the borders. Um, that's what you've got to build on. But this is what I suggest is, is the, is the uh, approach uh, with contingents, um, some converging on Edinburgh, I think we've got that uh, backed up by historical sources, others coming from Glasgow, uh, the Forbes uh, near Lanark across the, the Clyde and heading over to uh, Lauder. Um, with the guns probably, uh, the, the, the the route in blue is, is a route of the um, artillery, which is probably deliberately being kept separate from a lot of the other contingents. And one of the big issues is whether the, the guns really could have crossed the Tweed at Melrose and gone into England um, from the direction of Warwick. Um, that's what we're trying to do, is, is build up a picture which um, we, we might be able to test uh, archaeologically. So, um, Richard Carlton, who's here, will, will talk a bit about the, the archaeology of this uh, this afternoon. So, what sort of understanding um, is this helping us to achieve uh, about the about the battle and the campaign? Um, well, I think uh, any any serious work on, on documents um, is is helpful, and I think it's worth remembering that that um, we as archaeologists have not necessarily been. Uh, best served by a lot of the historians of the period who haven't tended to take an interest in this sort of material or look at it critically or in great detail. Uh, and there's still a lot more of that to be done. But looking at it again, the campaign, um, the organisation, what actually went down there, and the way that um, the Scots took out uh, a series of castles, uh, Wark, probably Norham, Ettel, um, and um, fourth uh, in the north of England. That has to be one of the most successful military campaigns in this island ever. The organisation was impressive, it was faultless, the, the um, slick way that we dealt with all these places and took them apart. There was never another campaign like it, it was a fantastic success. There was just the small matter of what happened in the moor nearby uh, on the afternoon of the 9th of September. And was it just that James was uh, seriously unlucky in losing his life? I have a final parting observation for you. Um, is we Scots who've turned Flodden into a great disaster, been many other disasters in the past in battles. The losses were probably not all that great, really, compared with other losses. All right, we lost a lot of king and a lot of the nobles. Government didn't stop. No major family in Scotland died out as a result of it. We were raiding into England soon afterwards. The English didn't capitalise on it. I wonder if James hadn't died, if he'd actually just got back to Edinburgh with uh, a slightly bedraggled army, if we wouldn't have actually claimed it. Not quite as a success, but certainly not as a defeat. Here's a thought for you. Thank you very much.